Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Investing in Startups panel. Uh, it's the last panel of the conference, and then we'll be back in C06. Uh, but I'll turn it over, and they'll each give a short introduction. Great. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, thank you to the Penn Blockchain Club. Uh, we're in the Penn community for inviting us all here today. Uh, really excited to be back at my alma mater for this panel. Um, obviously, Penn represents you know, best in class engineering, your war in, and leading edge finance. Um, brilliant minds here, and I think that we have an opportunity to be one of the number one players as a university guiding the path forward for crypto and blockchain. So, excited for you all to be here. My name is Mark Weinstein. I am a principal at a venture capital fund out of Los Angeles called Wave Financial. Uh, we invest in both equity and tokens. Uh, and are trying to uh, elevate the crypto industry towards maturity. Hi, I'm Nisa Amoyles. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I am a venture capital investor. I've been uh, investing for the past decade, primarily uh, as a family office, but also out of Scout Ventures. And I focus on building out um, the infrastructure for the future of finance as a thesis, and started out as a securities lawyer. Um, so well, I did not participate in ICOs, but as things move towards uh, more regulation, I'm more interested and more involved. Um, Matt Shapiro, I'm a principal at Multicoin Capital. Um, I'm not a Penn alum, but please, please don't hold that against me. Um, Multicoin is a, we'll a thesis-driven uh, <laughs> investment fund um, focused on, on crypto assets. Um, we invest predominantly um, in, in cryptocurrencies themselves and tokens. Um, we really focus on fundamental research and analysis of blockchain protocols, consensus mechanisms, token design, uh, teams, market opportunities, and, and on-chain data analysis to, to make that. Hi, I'm Dalek Jobin Putra. I am a Wharton undergrad uh, alum from 1994. I have no problems aging myself. <laughs> um, I am um, uh, founder of Future Perfect Ventures. Um, I started the, the fund in, in 2014 with a thesis around decentralization, um, uh, primarily blockchain uh, with uh, the intersection of um, AI and Internet of Things. We're currently investing out of our second fund. We're based in New York City, but invest globally. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time and for coming in today. We've got an exciting panel, so let's just dive in. So can you guys talk about the difference between traditional venture investing um, versus investing in the crypto space? Nisa, you can take it away, yeah. We'll start so, with you and rotate yeah, around. I think in traditional venture, you look at all those things like the team, the market size, product market fit, um, competition. I think all of those are still relevant um, in blockchain investing. I think if you're also looking at investing in nascent um, markets or protocols, you're going to focus on other things like governance and um, community and how the incentives of token holders are aligned, how uh, developers are incented to stay on the network once uh, their markets are incented. So I think it depends what sector you're looking at, um, but I think traditional venture capital is a set very well suited to long-term build and long-term mindset, especially at this time. Mm. And what about you, Matt? What do you think? I mean, I think there are actually very similar and very different in, in a handful of ways. Like it, it, it's, it's similar because you're still talking about an early stage project. It still needs a team. It still needs to find product market fit. Um, but in crypto, it's, it's, it's a little bit different just really because of the lack of precedent and, and how you think about value creation versus value capture. Um, I think in, in traditional startups, you know, you have a company that creates value. They sell a product, they make revenue, and entirely make costs. Um, and you could wrap your head around cash flows, or, or even if you're not making cash flows, you have a user base that you can monetize or someone will buy from distribution. Um, in, in crypto, you don't necessarily have that, right? You have a lot of different designs in, in, token, um, in tokens themselves, and, and there's a vast 
difference between creating value for a protocol, but actually have some of that value um, accrue to the token. And so, you know, when you're thinking about investing in, in crypto, you're, you're taking on, you know, a lot of the analysis that you would do with early stage, you know, venture, but you really have to think critically about um, what asset you own and why it will do that. And that's probably one of the bigger differences. I, I think there are a lot of similarities. So um, our first fund uh, focused on um, equity. I've been a VC since 99, so early stage equity is something I understand really well um, through different uh, market cycles. Um, and and uh, But I'm actually, I've been a big supporter of tokenization. I, I believe that um, we are going to see more and more things tokenized. We're going to see new business models start to emerge um, that you know we can't even dream about right now or don't even know what they will be. I think the challenge of, um, you know, we put the, um, we, we just got way ahead of ourselves in, in, in 2017 with all these projects, fundamentally just raising money um, uh, under the guise of, you know, crypto economics and, and token mm. models. And so where I think we're getting to right now is, is you know, are the things um, that have been mentioned before, which is, you know, what's the right governance model. That is not going, you know, we're not going to figure that out, and that's going to vary by, by use case. And, and so most, we're not going to figure that out any time soon, I should say, we will figure that out. Um, what we're seeing a lot of right now, because we do focus on the earliest stages, is entrepreneurs raising small equity rounds um, uh, with the notion of, of uh, you know, figuring out what those right token economics are going to look like. So even if they want to figure those out down the road, they realize that they need some time to build and, and see how the market reacts before they go public uh, with the tokens. And that's very different from uh, two years. Interesting. So I'm going to skip ahead. I mean, Union Square Ventures, I think in 2016 or early 2017, came out with something called the FAP Protocol Thesis. Um, you know, existing internet, most of the value accrues to the application layer where consumers are. But if you could tokenize the underlying protocols, DNS, HTML, et cetera, they would be centi billion dollar businesses or trillion dollar businesses today. Um, I think what we've seen in the market is that, you know, we don't know where value capture is going to happen. Uh, how do you feel about the FAT protocol thesis? Um, do you think that it's true always? Do you think that it's true sometimes? Or do you think that we finally realize that it's, it's not? I think it's too early to know. OK. Um, I, think I like that answer. I think we'll know when, once we have um, the centralized applications that have been built that um, have millions of users, as opposed mm -hmm. to just a couple thousand. Um, but I think, you know, part of that thesis focuses on data sharing um, and the ability for blockchain to enable data sharing. And uh, it certainly does, but I think not all data will be shared. Um, and uh, you can also, like Enigma, you can build something that's off-chain or build your own protocol. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be built on that protocol. So it's unclear where the value will be captured. I would say maybe, right? It's 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 nuanced, right? I, I mean, we're, we're, we're big so fans. we don't know. Well, well, I, mean, I think it's more nuanced than that, right? I think that um, look, we're big fans of Union Square Ventures, and Joel, Joel's a super smart guy, and I think he's helped push the ecosystem forward tremendously. Mm. But when when we think about it, it really depends on what your definition of the protocol is and where it fits in the stack. Mm. Um, so I think that layer one protocols have the ability to compete for you know a global state free market. Um, and I think something like that has the ability to, to acquire monetary premium. And I think that in that case, it, a fat protocol, uh, whatever gets that use case, will, will almost certainly be a fat protocol. Um, so I think it's certainly relevant there. Um, I think that as you move further up the stack, there's still an opportunity for a lot of these protocols to create, you know, to be fat and create value. Um, but there are also going to be opportunities for companies that build on top of these protocols to create a tremendous amount of value as well. And so I think as you move further up the stack, you could see um, dis different risk reward profiles where um, you can invest in a non layer one protocol per se that can accrue value as a fat protocol, but some of the, uh, there may be disproportionate value for the companies building on top of it where one or two or three companies drive the vast majority of the value to that protocol and maybe they make outside, you know, risk adjusted returns. Mm. Yeah. So, it's going to be boring and agree. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, Leo, I, I think what, what makes, um, uh, this sector so interesting though is that um, uh, different protocols will have different economic
economics have created them. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's all going to be about uh, what value is going to the end user. <laughs> mm. And I, I actually uh, was never, I, I, I did not subscribe to the fact that uh, but I actually think as time goes on, we may see more distribution of value, um, you know, from, I, I still call it middle, you know, so you have layer one and then what I call middleware, which a lot of people call layer two, um, all the way up to the application layer. So, well, you know, we, we'll be able, but, but, but what I love about this is it's going to be, um, you know, I think about it in terms of overall meritocracy. What, what is adding the most value? What application? What piece of the technology is adding the most value to the end user? And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a world where that's where the value will occur. I, I, um, Nick, I recently read Nick Carter posted about um, Mastercoin. And Mastercoin was one of the first ICOs um, well before some of these others. And it actually led to the creation of Tether which has moved billions of dollars on the Bitcoin network. And yet, if you look at a price chart for MasterCoin, you know, it's near zero, right? So clearly you can add value, but not capture that value, as you were saying. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to kind of figure that out. Um, on the point of value capture, I think we've moved from ICOs, ICOs, ICOs in kind of 17, early 18. Um, you know, a lot of pump and dump schemes, obviously, but there were some real companies raising uh, during that trend. And now we've moved over to utility tokens are dead, right? Like there is no need for, for a token within many networks. Um, how, how do you guys feel about where we are today? Uh, is there a need for applications to have their own token in some instances? I think it depends. You know, I think in some instances you will need a token and in others you won't. Mm -hmm. But I don't I don't think it's like a linear path that we move from um, you know, ICOs to utility tokens to, you know, SPOs. Um, I think it depends what you're trying to do. Um, but I don't think that um, utility tokens are dead. I think we might see more hybrid forms of um, security, utility. Uh, being issued together, and I think you know what is dead is just raising money for the sake of raising money without anything behind it. I think that you know what we will see being regulated going forward is going to be all about uh, protecting the retail. And Matt, I know you guys, you know, you still invest in tokens. Um, yes. Recently, you invested in Live Peer. Um, you know that. Thesis, I think, is all about value capture, right? So, how do you how do you think about utility tokens? Yeah, I, th I think you know what people term as ICOs have, have been have been dead effectively since then, 2017. Um, I think while a lot of that move, you know, a lot of that funding has moved back into you know uh, private round under Red Key and securities exemptions, which is which is all good. Um, and I think that a lot of it is out of the light because a lot of these projects are, are private and sort of you know building and, and trying to find product market fit and developing the right teams and, and strategy around token economics. But the amount of innovation that's happening on what the actual token models are has been astounding. I mean, it was very naive in the beginning where it was like, hey, I'm just going to throw this token in and we're going to pay for stuff and, and it's going to work and create value. It, it was a fantastic fundraising tool. But there's a reason that we don't have, you know, pay for our coffee in a different currency that we pay for our gasoline or whatever. Um, it's just inefficient. When Starbucks coin. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just inefficient. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time working with early stage companies thinking about, you know, look, not every company is going to need a blockchain and not every project needs a token, right? So figuring out, does it need a token? Why would it have value? Can it provision scarce resources? Um, and then how to actually design it. So whether it's a work token model or it's a burn mint equilibrium or there's a lot of innovation that's happening around what is the right way to not only incentivize all the participants and the stakeholders, but also create a token where the value of the underlying token will accrue commensurately with the utilization of the, of the overall protocol. So there's been, it's been fantastic to, to be a part of that and involved in it. And I think that it's out of the public eye now, but I think as a lot of these projects launch in the next six to 12 months, um, we're, we're gonna see a lot more um, innovation and, and a lot more um, you know, media around it. Yeah, I'm, I'm more excited than ever. Yeah, having spent six, six years in the same town. Um, and, um, and, and what I'm, um, what's 
great to see is these teens that, that have been at it for a while um, and, and were out of the public eye. You know, they weren't necessarily doing ICOs and, or, um, and, and um, were frustrated, I think, just as much as you know, the people, everyone who really cared about the sector and the long-term growth of the sector. Yeah. Um, but they were heads down building and realizing, you know, any new technology, new business models, new incentives. I mean, we're, we're not only talking about, like, new business models, we're talking about a different way of looking at the world. Um, mm. And this is the first time I think that's happened since the internet. Um, when, um, you know, I, I remember um, uh, uh, talking to bankers about email in, in 1995, and a lot of them said, we'll never use email. <laughs> Uh, these are my colleagues, and they're like, you know, why would I use email when I can just pick up the phone and call someone? It's the same argument I hear against, like, you know, why blockchain in the enterprise, or, you know, why, why this or why that? It makes no sense. Why internet money? You know, why programmable money? And, and you know, one day we're going to wake up 20 years from now, and we're all going to be using this infrastructure in, in uh, some capacity or another. And all of that groundwork, um, I, I'd say, is accelerated in the last few years uh, in terms of getting built. So. Um, uh, you know, there's this first wave of 2013, 14, 15. There was a crypto winter back then. That's when I got into this space. A lot of those companies that were heads down are now leaders in the space. We're seeing this uh, a new wave of the same thing happening that we'll be hearing about some of these new companies a year or two. It's like uh, MakerDAO, the the overnight success that took five years. Right. I agreed. Um, definitely never. I, I don't know if there's been a more exciting time to be in this space. Um, in spite of prices being down and we're in a crypto winter, I mean, conferences have slowed, which is great. We're finally seeing conferences start to shut down. Um, so I think that might be the end of capitulation or something close. Uh, but there are teams that are doing incredible things, and I know we're all on the front line seeing that. And just to add to that, yeah. I think it's a great time to be in venture in space because the valuations are lower. Mm. The teams are building. Um, there's less noise. There's more signal. Mm -hmm. And so I think vintage 2019 will be turn out to be a great uh, year for venture. Well, we're going to get to the signal and noise section later, so <laughs> I sent them questions beforehand, <laughs> so they're ready, ready to go. What um what what about decentralization? Because I think decentralization is a buzzword that seems to be overused. And I know Chris Berniski recently wrote about centralized apps built on top of decentralized protocols. Um, how important is the is decentralization when you look at investing in blockchain and crypto projects? So I, and anyone I, can take, by the way. Oh, I agree with you yeah. that um, the whole word has become weaponized and um, polarizing, but I think it's really back to like a continuum, and there are certain projects that are uh, decentralized uh, all the way. There's others that are might function better in a centralized fun uh, capacity, such as like digitized assets and building up an infrastructure. But I think it, it really is like a continuum of trust, really. And so um, I don't tend to focus on that so much when I'm looking at an investment. I, I more look at the project itself and what it's trying to accomplish, and then back into whether decentralization makes sense in that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, and I think that people talk about decentralization as if, as if it's this binary thing. Like it's either decentralized or it's not. Mm. And, and frankly, it's, it's like most things, a spectrum. Um, and I would argue that no one will ever be fully decentralized. Because I don't think any one of us, if you ask everyone in this room what they think the definition of decentralization is, everyone will give you a different answer. So it's really understanding why does a project actually need to be decentralized? And then how do you, how do you get there? And how decentralized is, is good enough? Right, and a lot of times, what I think is this is it's often the path to get there. That's that's the most important. Um, who's bootstrapping these protocols in the beginning? Who's helping them um, um, evolve? And who's being the initial customers and the initial suppliers? That's just as important, arguably more important than the ultimate set of decentralization that you're actually ending up with. And and I think on top of that, there's a lot of tech and a lot of innovation that's coming out that may actually make decentralization like even not actually important. Right? When you have something like zero knowledge proofs, you can all of a sudden start. Proving, you know, mathematically guaranteeing that things are being done right, and so if that's the case, you need a million people along the, uh, all over the world to come to consensus that that is true or not. Right, and so there's a lot of, of, of tech and innovation that's coming out that's really going to expand the scope of, of what blockchain can do. Frankly, 
So I think we're seeing a lot of experimentation. We, we don't invest in science experiments because yeah. uh, I mean, we, we do have to return money to our investors. And, and so while it, there's um, a lot of projects out there that I think are going to be uh, transformative in terms of laying the groundwork for, for um, the future companies, we look very much at you know, is, is this company going to be able to scale to a point where they're going to be attractive to an acquirer or potentially issue a token where there, there will be a, a new avenue of liquidity for, a, a, say, a venture fund? Uh, or will they be able to stay in it for the long haul and, and um, you know, go, go to a, a broader, uh, you know, a traditional uh, private market, uh, a public market sale? So, um, <coughs> So, so you know, it's a balance. Um, I, I, I think um, this notion that everything's going to be decentralized, even though our thesis was around decentralization back in 2014, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost <laughs> like, you know, it, 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 it's it has too changed. Extreme. Yeah, it, it's kind of like when things get too hot, I, I take a step back, or, you know, I, I don't like when people start to quote me. <laughs> like it's time to go on to the next thing, um, and and so um, so it's it's and I think it's going to vary by use case. I think it's going to vary by region. Um, I think uh, what I'm really excited about is the intersection of, of data and AI and and the new kind of uh, data modeling that can happen once you start to have decentralized data out there along with things like zero knowledge proofs. Mm. Well, I mean, you mentioned a science experiment, right? And I think that uh, today we're almost still in experimentation mode. Um, there's no users, right, or limited users outside of maybe Bitcoin and actually spending that or store value for some um, sovereign nations that are having inflation in their underlying currency. I mean, what is going to get us to adoption where all of us are using these applications or these protocols in our day-to-day -day lives and don't even realize it. How far away are we from that? And then, in your mind, what is the catalyst that's going to bring us there? I think it's about scale and efficiency of some of the underlying technology. I mean, it's, it's um, not dissimilar to what we saw with broad broadband and mobile adoption, right? I mean, we, we weren't at a point where people could adopt e-commerce, et, et cetera, because the underlying scale, um, security, et cetera, was not in place. Uh, for broad usage. Um, I, I think a lot of this is going to be seamless and invisible usage. Um, we're going to have these hybrid applications um, where we won't know where we're going on and off the blockchain necessarily. Um, I, I want to see a world, um, you know, hopefully you know, before I die, <laughs> where we'll see tokenization and more equitable ownership of different assets. And, um, uh, around the world, and, and that will be maybe a more overt use case of it. Um, but even if you look at Bitcoin's history, right, I mean, it started off as, as cross-border money, and then it's morphed into a store of value, and it's, it's going to continue to morph. Mm. Um, and if I look at portfolio companies from 2014, they've already undergone, some of them have undergone several pivots, and, and that's, again, kind of, I mean, we, we're used to seeing uh, companies undergo pivots, but the velocity of that is, yes. is happening much faster in the sector and very similar to what we saw in the, you know, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah and I mean, scalability and infrastructure, it, it, a lot of this is happening in parallel, right? So there's obviously a need for that because it's just you just can't get any, any sort of applications that you would get on a centralized system in, in, in the decentralized world yet um, and on blockchains. But, but I would also add to that um, education. Um, most people, you know, still don't understand crypto or blockchain, and I think that something that could set everything off is that, you know, an app that we all use every day ends up using blockchain as a plumbing, um, and nobody really knows it. And somebody comes out and says, "Hey, that app that we all use, it's actually running on a blockchain, and the stuff is real." Um, that could really, really click and, and make people really interested. Um, the other aspect. When you said education, I was just thinking, you know, like I, I don't know technologically how email works behind the scenes, right? Okay. Maybe, right? I don't have to. I have no idea how my car works. Like, yeah. I just get it in the right? Like, <laughs> exactly. And, and I love that. Like, I, I, I'm just never going to know what a piston is, and I, I just don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. At least someone know. <laughs> somewhere there, yeah. Somewhere there. Um, and then the other aspect is, is that comes along with that, I think, in parallel, is, is actually user interface. Like, th these are, I think there's a misconception that, like, blockchain is meant for us, like, as users. It's really not to develop a tool. Um, and it's really hard to use today. 
Um, if you wanted to use blockchain and you are not a technical person by nature, even with the, the like, I can tell you where we were a year ago and where we are today is like light years ahead. And like for a new user coming into the space, you're just going to be the funnel. Um, it's, just, it's just not there yet. And so I think that as these systems get tried and tested and they work as, as they're supposed to, you're going to start getting more entrance into the system and people are going to spend more time thinking less about how can we secure that this works because it already is. And you can start moving up the layer stack and say, great, how can we now focus our attention on getting users? Well, let's make this seamless. Let's make this quick, you know, plug and play. Um, and I think that's also going to get a lot of users on board. What, I mean, what infrastructure are you seeing come into place that you know, is necessary to drive adoption? I mean, like the straight developer tooling. I mean, build, building on a, a blockchain is nothing that you would get in the traditional world. Like someone working at Google has all these, you know, libraries and programs, uh, languages available to them, and, and in, in crypto, you just, you just don't really have that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you've been seeing today is that a lot of projects are doing everything. Um, so if you're an application, you have to figure out how do I build on top? Nobody's really helping you. Uh, how do I actually get the information out of the blockchain that I want? into my application, and then I have to also build my application, if my product doesn't fit, and deal with customer acquisition. Like, that's a lot. And so what you're starting to see now is that a lot of the components on the back end are becoming much more modular, as, as they sort of should be. You're getting people who are specializing in companies that are just going to query data for you. And they're going to say, hey, we're just going to say, uh, if you want to get data out of the blockchain, you use us, you pay us you know, per ping, and you know, micro payment, and I'm going to get all the information you want out of Ethereum, or whatever blockchain, I'm going to put it in your app. And now you actually don't have to worry about that at all. Refocus your efforts on what your core competency is. Really you want. So there's like little things like that that most people I think don't, don't necessarily see, um, but are a lot of problems that, that engineers and developer talent have, have in the space of that. It's getting solved. So I agree with what was said, but I would also add that there are certain places in the market where infrastructure build up doesn't necessarily have to happen, um, and the consumer behavior is already such that they're accustomed. To use to pay for things digitally, and one of those areas is non fungible tokens and gaming. So I think that we'll probably see something along the lines of crypto kitties, but even uh, much greater than that. And probably that will um, be a turning point in the consumer uh, adoption moment. And then on the other side, non crypto, but um, the digitized assets. We have tons of players rushing in to build that infrastructure, infrastructure now, from mm -hmm. um, broker dealers to qualified custodians to um, exchanges, and um, I think so. That will once that infrastructure is built, and once we see some um, high yield deals come through and start trading, that will attract more institutional involvement in the. Absolutely. I think it's, it's clear from your answers that you're all focused on, on different areas in the space. And it's, um, that's one of the things that's most exciting about this industry is it literally covers every, every other industry vertical. And then you have the whole stack. Um, so on that note, I guess I'm curious what you're most excited about in the industry today, kind of what trends you're looking at, or even, I mean, no specific companies. This is not investment advice. Um, but you know what? What trends are most exciting? You you mentioned the NS, NFTs, and you said that's right. one. What else? Tokenized um, real assets, um, mm. such as real estate, uh, adventure funds, and art, and other things that could be fractionalized that will allow um, excuse me allow more investors into the space globally. That will uh, solve some of the liquidity issues in. Uh, a liquid asset, mm -hmm. um, and that will um, allow automation of those um, assets to be done in a much more efficient way, and governance to be handled much more creatively. So, for instance, if you're uh, Facebook and you wanted to reward your uh, shareholders that have held uh, the stock the longest, there's no way really for you to know who all your shareholders are. However, down the road, if um, you know Facebook has, decides to do uh, a digitized offering uh, instead of an IPO, then they'll be able to you know reward those shareholders. They'll be able to issue proxy voting and dividends and other um, you know cap table management functions automatically. And that's exciting to me is that this. Um, vastly improves the existing financial infrastructure that we have, and so I believe that's inevitable. Great. And that'll replace, I guess, the, um, there's one centralized party right now for shares. Is it, is it DTC? Is that DTCC? Yeah. 
So every stock trade basically goes through their vault. Interesting. What about you, Matt? What are you excited about? Um, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, like what Jalan said, there's, it's, there's so much to be excited about, frankly. But, <laughs> but you know, one, one of the interesting things that's that's gained a lot of traction is, is the concept of open finance and, mm. and decentralized finance. And I think one of one of the real superpowers of blockchain is, is a- access, you know, and inclusion for, for everybody on a global basis. And so, you know, just getting, you know. We're sort of rediscovering, you know, I think a lot of people in, in, in the world are in crypto at least are rediscovering finance sort of for the first time, which which is interesting in, in and of itself. But w- what I find really interesting is that, you know, there's this whole system that's being built outside of the traditional rails of, of what we have today, right? And somebody anywhere in the world can, in a permissionless way, go get a, a loan that's over, you know, super over collateralized um, and be able to extract, you know, value from the system without having to go to a bank that they may not have, or they may not have identification, they may not have a bank, you know, a bank account. Like there's, there's a lot of, of ways that we can empower, you know, humans on a global basis, and I think that's one of, one of the most interesting things to see how all these, um, you know, pieces of data that float out there and represent value can, can be used and, and, can, and rebuilt and rebundled in different ways to add value. So. Go ahead, Jill. Was- oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And like BitPesa was one of my first investments, mm-hmm. um, uh, and I was born in Nairobi, and and so the emerging markets were really where my mind went when I went to my first uh, mm-hmm. Bitcoin conference because we don't have legacy institutions in place, whether you're talking about banking or insurance or you know almost anything in in a lot of these regions. So there's nothing to really disrupt. There's mm-hmm. only opportunity to. And so I, I am looking, I mean, you know, Africa is a market that I think most US VCs stay away from. Um, we, we were in there very early in the space. Um, and I, and I th- what, what's great is I think there's going to be a combination of talent that, that's in developed markets that is addressing some of the opportunities. Um, uh, and, 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 and some of these, frankly, rest less regulated markets. Now that doesn't mean it's easy to get to market because you have lots of other issues like corruption and intermediaries of different sorts in, in these regions, but, but there, that allows a lot of um, experimentation. You, met, you mentioned value extraction. I think about it broadly as value creation. Like for the longest time, it's, it was all about extraction. Um, extracting, re- I mean, if you even look at the environment, extracting resources, extracting, you know, dollars from one data. party or another, or data. Now it, we're going to flip around and, and we're going to see, you know, uh, that actually the pie can be bigger when you have more participation, whether it's at small businesses, individuals, or larger enterprises. And, and the, the companies of the future are going to look a lot different. I think we're making a lot of progress in terms of the concept of the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Mm. Um, uh, you know, it did work in version 1.0, but there's lots of smart people working on how do we make it work for, for the, next, uh, you know, the next iteration. Yeah, and we just saw, I think, Moloch DAO released to provide grants for the Ethereum community. Um, that's just a fascinating experiment to track. Um, you know, I, I want to go back to a couple of things. So we're talking about emerging markets now. Um, I think you know, Abra just released. I think you can buy Nasdaq shares uh, on the Bitcoin network through Abra, which is an incredible innovation for middle class individuals overseas that don't have access to our markets. I think that's great. Um, you know, I guess are we able? Do you believe that we'll be able to jump in the emerging markets the same way that they jumped over wired to mobile to wireless? Do you think we'll be able to jump to these decentralized protocols, or is there a middle step that needs to be taken um, in the interim? Right, like, is there lower hanging fruit, so to speak, in Africa that um, can solve some of the problems that maybe blockchain cannot? Uh, well, Opera is an question. interesting. I, I mentioned pivots, <laughs> right? I, I was a pre-launch investor in mm-hmm. Opera, and the original um, business model or, or about, uh, idea there uh, that Bill had was uh, use the Bitcoin blockchain as a uh, rail for cross-border remittances. So very similar to what Bitpesa is doing mm-hmm. for the rest of the world. And, and, Walla, uh, and Walla as well in Africa, right? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but then what happened was all these people in like the Philippines and these markets that they were um, targeting said, well, we want to actually hold Bitcoin. We heard, you know, we, heard, we read about this and, and we don't necessarily want to cash out in our local currency. And then that model has evolved and, and um, they built a stable coin on the back end because 
they had to, right, to, to, to hedge the, the transactions that they were, they were uh, building for the remittance rails. So, so that's an example of, um, yeah, they did leapfrog <laughs> in a big way because these people in emerging markets were demanding this access uh, to, and we're talking about smaller amounts of Bitcoin. Like if you look at remittances, they're, they're, um, in, in terms of individuals, much smaller amounts, but uh, well before most people here would feel comfortable holding uh, a cryptocurrency. Mm. So I, w I would argue that, like, I mean, I approach it as a given that these, these markets are leapfrogging and will leapfrog. Um, it's like WhatsApp. It's going to be maybe in different um, uh, different transaction values, but the volumes are going to be Ooh, you just You just sparked a new question because you mentioned <laughs> WhatsApp. So let's talk about Zuckbucks. Um, is that what it's called these days? I, that's what I'm calling it. I, I don't know if I coined it, but you can say that I did. Um, so, you know, Facebook obviously made this big announcement that they're entering the market. They're building out one of the largest blockchain teams um, out there right now. JPM announces JPM coin. Um, we're seeing a lot of the existing players uh, enter the space in, in one way or another. Uh, I guess first let's start with, is that good or bad for the industry? Um, yeah, let's start with that. It's great. It's great, great for the industry. It's like, you have the most graduated institution on the planet, JP Morgan, releasing a cryptocurrency that they call a crypto, it's not, but they have <laughs> And why not? To all their clients. I mean, it offers nothing that, that, that a traditional cryptocurrency has, right? It's not immutable, it's not uh, permissionless, it's, it's, it's not decentralized. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I've never seen, you know, I have a traditional finance background. Like I've never seen so many people get excited about effectively a balance sheet adjustment. Um, it's like <laughs> your company accounting on steroids. Right? It's the ability for for one person to pay another within the JP Morgan system and just it happens instantly, right? And so but that's really powerful because now all the people that work at JPM now have to pay attention to this. They have to understand what a blockchain is, why it's valuable, why we're using it, and how to you know deal with other people's wallets. All their customers now have to do this, and what their customers are going to see pretty quickly. And we're seeing this on the market infrastructure side, like OTC desks, they don't want our fiat um, to collapse. Like they want, you know, stable coins because they get 24 seven settlement. Um, and that's really powerful for a lot of companies, especially when you think about um, capital intensive companies or companies that have working capital. Like this is, a, this is gonna change the game for that, right? Or even so, startups that need funding and it yeah. takes two weeks to clear bank statements exactly. instead of just getting a stable coin investment. Exactly, and so now, 15 minutes. So, you're, so, so what you're doing is you're onboarding all these traditional, you know, white collar, you know, folks um, to understand what cryptocurrencies are and why they're valuable, and you see them in a tangible and the day-to-day -day business, all of a sudden you start, you know, that helps them get that further down the rabbit hole and say, well, what are the other things that I could do? What is a real cryptocurrency, I would, I would say, and why does that have, have power? And that's not so different than what they're sort of accustomed to. But, but what about the crypto anarchists? I mean, what about the individuals that, you know, consider themselves to be building a system outside of the system? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we as investors consider that uh, population, that community, who see something like JPM coin as trying to um, co-opt co this movement. So I don't, I don't think they're, I don't think it's a competitive. I think that's what people miss. It's mm. complementary, um, and so it's complementary from an education perspective. There's no better way to get a billion people on board it than to use it every day and what they do already, mm. right? And then it's only a matter of time until people start to understand what are the differences between JPM coin versus like a Bitcoin. And why is Bitcoin valuable? How is it different? What what is this system providing me that the existing system doesn't? So is it a way to opt out? Is it a way to hedge? Is it an insurance policy? Is it value creation? Um, there, there's just a lot of different ways. So I think that you know the, the crypto anarchists like it's still going to work. Like the crypto is it, it's, it's still going on, and this is just a complementary way. I, I view it as like free onboarding. Like great, let them let them do it. Um, but what, what we're all focused on are the opportunities, you know, away from centralized stuff and, and into decentralized um, applications and, and infrastructure. That's that's where a lot of value is going to be created and it's going to continue. So, but my question really is about the timing of JP's announcement because they were uh, publicly, you know, against some of the stuff that was happening in the market like a year earlier. So, what <coughs> switch to um, create this announcement now to create this product? Maybe it was in the works for years, but. You know, why now? I mean, they, they've been working on it. They've been very good. I mean, they've always had one of the largest blockchain groups on Wall Street. So I don't think they changed anything. It's the well, way the press has. The press. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not JP Morgan changing anything. I mean, Quorum, you know, has been worked on and, and has been incorporating some of the public 
uh, blockchain technology uh, and for, for years and years. Mm -hmm. So every, every yeah. bank, every bank has a blockchain. Like it may not be public, they're not shouting it from the rooftops, hey, I'm working on blockchain, but I can guarantee you every, every banking group has a blockchain group. And what they do with that and how they drive that decision making is very different, right? There's some that are saying, how can I use blockchain technology to get bigger market share and increase our revenue? Others are saying, hey, you know, it's actually easier, why don't we just use this on the back end and we can cut a lot of the costs. So the strategies of each bank is different. Um, but the fact that everyone under the sun is, is, is doing something here, like, guys, right. like, we're on something. Like, yeah, that's, that's why we're here. Um, so I guess I want to I want to go back to a couple of things. W one question I have is, what what time horizon do you all think about when you invest? Because you know product market fit is this interesting beast, right? And some people say with open source product market fit actually comes in two phases: first with developers, then with users. Um, so you know I look at something like I'll just throw out Dharma Lever, right? That just came out, and it talks about democratizing finance and this trend of open finance and Everyone should have access to, you know, to reasonably priced loans, and emerging markets should have reasonably priced loans. And yet, the main use case right now is leverage for speculating on crypto assets. Um, so, how do we, th you know, maybe it will grow into something different, but how long is that time horizon? And I love the Dharma team, by the way, and there's some Penn grads on that team. So I don't mean to single them out, but you know, how how long do you think about when you think? What is the time horizon you use when you think about investing in these companies? So in a venture scenario, um, you're investing for the long term. And sometimes that's five, eight years, um, maybe even longer, uh, and a few pivots along the way. So I think um, you, know, you always have to be focused on that time horizon and that lens and getting to product market fit hopefully earlier than later. Um, so I think if you're actively trading, that's a much different time horizon. Right? That you're, looking at the markets every day, you're looking at the prices of the coins. But then I guess what's the point of liquidity and what's the point of having a token, um, that investing in a token, um, you know, does it create mis misaligned incentives for investors as well? I don't know, what do you think? So, yeah, so, so, so I think that, look, I think crypto is early stage. It's akin to early stage venture investing, um, high risk tech investing. And so, you know, we invest with, the intention to hold for, you know, frankly, as long as it takes for our investment thesis to play out, right? In many cases, we think this is, this is early and there's a lot even, of Even your token investments? Yeah, no, no, no different. But, but what's different What I happens is, when they turn against you? Like, so, well, what the happens, price, well, I mean. Well, what's, what's different is that I think if you're thinking about venture capital investing, you typically are investing around illiquidity, right? You're owning 30 to 40 different assets. Most of them actually go to zero, right? And if you have marginal return and a couple of their home runs and they return your whole fund, right? So I think if you're going to think about venture investing and you went to a venture investor and said, um, you know, it, imagine everything is the same and you had, your, your investments had liquidity, would you construct your portfolio in the same way? And I think the answer would be no. And so that's, that's what, what we try to do is we embrace the liquidity and we say, how can we construct a better portfolio and how can we use it to actually manage our risk? Um, and so I think that's mm -hmm. something that we do that's a little different and I think it requires, you know, it's nuances. The, the, you know, crypto doesn't necessarily fit in venture capital. Not to mention the legal structures. Yeah, and it doesn't, and it doesn't <laughs> trip. And, but it doesn't also fit in hedge, hedge funds either, right? It's somewhere in the middle. And so I think, you know, approaching it from first principles and sort of creating a, a crypto native strategy, I think, I think is optimal. Anything to add? You no, know, I've been thinking a lot about that. I, I mean, I'm excited about having more liquidity. I don't, you know, love having, like, uh, offering, uh, you know, a ten-year liquid fund. I mean, it's much harder to raise money. <laughs> I don't know. You can argue, you know, depending on market conditions. But so, um, and, and but where I think this matters, uh, I mean, we always look at team first and foremost. But um, given all the pivots, given all the different models, given that you want to invest in, in uh, the right incentives, the, the uh, right motivations, or or aligned motivations, that's where um, I, I spend a lot of time with the teams up front. Never, and that's why we stayed away from that ICO market because there wasn't time. You know, it was frenzied. You know, it was a frenzy, and, and it, it's like any, and this happens in venture, um, you know, non token markets where, you know, hot deal, you'll have to sign overnight. We never participate in those. So um, I think team, team is just so important in alignment with the thesis. So and so is already invested. This person's invested. Like, you got to get in that, quick, or I you're gonna miss it. It's it's cra it's crazy out there. I guess I guess my question is though, like it's it's almost the, the liquidity provides um, a challenge as an investor because 
it's almost irresponsible if you have an investment that you made and it appreciates, let's say, 5x in value um, in a short period of time, but your long term, you have a lo positive long term view and you don't take gains, knowing that there's going to be you know, market cycles and it, it will come down. Right, so I mean, how do you think about de-risking those investments? It's, it's a challenging oh, question. Oh, we're, we're not, I, mean, I wanna hear from you, um, yeah. actually, so I'm just gonna uh, pipe in here. And that, uh, it, it's, um, uh, at the end of the day, we, we, we need to have, we have target returns for our investors, and we're portfolio managers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and so I, I always look at any opportunity, there are a lot of secondary opportunities in, in equity investments. These days, because of the amount of later stage money coming in, we almost always have an opportunity to exit mm. um, in later stage rounds. Um, and it's really, um, and, and I think it's also communicating with the entrepreneurs that you know we, we are long term investors, but at a certain point we may need to exit. Um, and and so I, I think it's up to us as portfolio managers to have those conversations with entrepreneurs. Um, but but we're, we don't we don't typically flip. Yeah, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not ICO investors. Um, that, that, that's not how we, how we build our, our firm. Um, you know, but, but it, it presents an interesting, you know, sort of, the, you know, dilemma. Yeah, it's really sure. how, how do you think about portfolio construction? How do you think about um, risks, and, risks and trade-offs, right? Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's being, being really into the underlying tech and understanding it, you know, there are different risks that we may see that the rest of the market doesn't because our knowledge base is different. So, you know, we may trim a position because of there's execution risk. Um, we may add to a position, right? That, that, that flexibility is both a benefit and, and, and a curse, right? So it really comes down to strong risk management. And really, you know, the problem with crypto is not that there's not no data, right? There's no 10Q and there's no 10K and there's no conference call. There's actually the opposite. You have too more much. data than you, it's too much data, right? And you have to go to 10 different places to get it. Right? You've got Telegram and Reddit and <laughs> Medium and Twitter and conference calls and developer and meetups. conferences. Right, and so, and so how do you take all that information and test it against your investment uses? And I think when you're investing in early stage with some technology, the market moves very, very quickly. It's the best market well, this, is, this is a perfect segue into our final segment, um, which is signal versus noise. So it's gonna be a lightning round. I'm going to mention one trend that's kind of hot on the market right now. And you're going to answer either with signal or noise. OK? All right, here we go. Are you guys ready? All right, I'm, I was really excited about this one. We were going a little bit over, but this is going to be great. OK. Um, signal, signal versus noise, security tokens. Signal. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, no. Come on. That's not the round. Let's go. I think it's, I think it's Signal short, long term, but short term noise. Short -term. Yes, yes, yes. Product market fit issues for sure. Yes. Okay. Same. Agree. All right. Fine. I'll allow that little that little maneuver. Savvy <laughs> investors over here. Okay. Open finance. Signal or noise or DeFi or dope fi. <laughs> you want to call it? Same answer. Oh. Okay. Matt, what do you think? I think signal. Signal. I think signal. Signal. Okay. Initial exchange offerings. <laughs> this is a toss up. Noise. He has a project coming up. That's probably it. I didn't even know what it was. Great. That's so it's noise. The concept is great, but it's only as good as the project that, you know. We can have a whole panel on IEOs for sure. I agree. It depends on the fundamentals, and it's, it's just another distribution method. Uh, NFTs. Nisa, you mentioned them earlier. Signal. 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 Uh, <laughs> I love this. Signal. It's just noise. Noise. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, ETH is dead. Signal or noise? Too early to tell. I like your answers. I mean, it's it's not nearly dead. Okay. Uh, so noise. noise. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And that's about the time that we have. <laughs> it wasn't as exciting as. Oh, it was so exciting! Come on. Thank you, panelists.